Okay, let's start with who I am and my relationship with the paint shop building. My experience with this site goes back about 25 years on and off, so I'm certainly not an outsider looking in. My current involvement at the paint shop in 2022 is a volunteer social member of Historic Electric Traction, the company currently vested with care of the New South Wales government-owned Heritage Electric Fleet and the current custodians of the building. At age 55, involved in the heritage sector for well over 30 years and also a current member of Transport Heritage New South Wales, I think I can claim a few credits for knowing what I'm talking about when it comes to heritage, especially when it comes to this particular site. Currently I attend HET's work days at the paint shop every few weeks or so, working on restoration of carriages and also ongoing maintenance of the building itself. Historically I was the electrician who designed and installed the current electrical installation there back in 1999 under contract to Railcorp and have recently carried out further work alongside others, augmenting this installation to modern standards. I've also worked in and around the building since that time, particularly up till 2004 and again from 2015. I am well versed in both the 2002 and 2008 master plans developed for this site. Whilst the 2008 plan is variously discussed in papers associated with the current proposals and has been since abandoned, the 2002 plans have not been mentioned at all and I find this disturbing. We'll discuss those later, however for now let's get into discussing the current plan. The wrong plan for the wrong place. Modern cities such as Sydney are becoming ghettos of rich people, where few working people can afford to live. Award-winning architects Jean-Philippe Fassal and Anne Lackerton warn. Known as the Never Demolish Architects, Fassal and Lackerton just won the Pritzker Prize, the world's most prestigious architectural prize, in 2021 for a series of projects where they refused to raise existing public housing apartment blocks and museums. Cities have become speculative places only because of the rising value of land compared with relatively, relatively low cost of construction. They are becoming places only for tourists, he said. Workers, artists and craftspeople and others on low income have been pushed out. Most of the time we talk about ghettos of poor people. But the biggest problem now is ghettos of rich people. This article was featured in the Sydney Morning Herald, 28th of July, 2022. The whole purpose of this plan for North Everly is to attempt to extract value from a government asset. This approach is nothing new. We only have to look across the track at South Everly for similar examples. The track record over there has been variously successful and a failure, requiring tweaks and resales in recent years in an attempt to gain the right mix of private and public investment. With the Australian Technology Park having failed over there at reaching its goals, it seems logical for the government to try it again on the north side, but this time with a few hundred residential apartments injected for good measure. The intent no doubt being for the New South Wales government to come back out in the black financially as opposed to in the red. There are however a few fundamental problems with this approach with the paint shop precinct. These problems persevered to strangle the 2008 proposal and no doubt will do so again in this most recent 2022 one. These problems are number one, the site is severely contaminated. The mere nature of the paint shop precinct as an industrial work site stretching 100 years of active service, including the use of lead-based paints, means that many liquid solvents and chemicals were in daily use on the site. Asbestos contamination is also extremely likely. The private development sector in New South Wales, raw and fresh with memories from the contamination debacle of the Rhodes Union Carbide site redevelopment in previous decades, which led to the developer losing hundreds of millions of dollars, are very unlikely to get on board with the paint shop precinct plans without the New South Wales government first decontaminating the site themselves. This decontamination, however, would be very likely seriously compromise heritage assets on the site and may not even be practical at all. Number two. The buildings on the site, referred to extensively in the reports, have heritage listings ranging from high to very high. Indeed, the paint shop building itself, built in 1888 and largely in original condition, is recognised by the 2008 study as being of international heritage significance, being one of the oldest standing industrial heritage buildings in Australia. This puts it on par with assets like Government House in Macquarie Street, Sydney, and even assets such as Big Ben and the Houses of Parliament in Britain. Number three. 
Road access to the site is extremely limited. Due to grade separation between the paint shop precinct and Wilson Street, which runs parallel to the site but about 5 metres higher than it, there is and will only ever be two road access points to the entire Carriage Works precinct. One is at the western end, which is currently used to access Carriage Works, and requires crossing of a shared vehicle and pedestrian right of way in order to gain access to the paint shop. The second and only other access is from Little Everly Street with connecting roads bearing very narrow, surrounded by privately owned heritage buildings and also including a shared walkway which currently is undergoing reconstruction to allow easier access between Redfern Station and Sydney University. Number four of course is the Carriage Works Art Precinct itself, it already exists on the site, which severely limits space potentially left for redevelopment. OK, let's talk about the real history of the paint shop. The challenge with any redevelopment of this type is to enable creation of enough leasable or saleable floor space in order to make project attractive for private investment. It's clear that the 2022 proposals have wrestled with this challenge. However, it's also clear that the amount of floor space required is several magnitudes higher than what can be reasonably realised from the paint shop precinct site without severely compromising the heritage concerns associated with the assets currently standing on it. There are 27 technical documents associated with this proposal. Each of these routinely run into hundreds of pages for a page count totalling well over 3,000. Much of the content of each report is repetitive, confusing and irrelevant. Clearly no single human is ever going to sit down and read all this, and so one is somewhat confused as to the reason for its existence. With the consultants' reports variously each costing the New South Wales government in vicinity of between $150,000 and $500,000 each, it's obvious that more than $5 million of government money has been spent preparing this proposal. If even a fraction of that money had been spent on the paint shop itself, then maybe it might present as a slightly more attractive asset to a private consortium of buyers or leasees instead of being the run-down and fragile shell that it currently is. My first visit to the paint shop was back in 1992 when it was in use as a scrapping venue for Sydney's old Red Rattlers. Part of the site, Road O and 1, was still in SRA use as an asbestos, asbestos removal facility at that time, whilst the rest was occupied by a scrapping contractor slowly chomping their way through the fleet. We visited over a few days to remove and obtain spare parts from the cars in order to assist in future preservation measures. A significant amount of damage was done to the buildings at this time, both by vandals and by the scrapping contractor. My next experience with the now derelict structure was when I first saw it in 1999. The then State Rail Heritage Division had just spent about $150,000 installing roller shutters on the openings in the building to secure it, and they needed someone to install power for these, so that's where I became involved. Shortly afterwards, the government-owned S170 listed Heritage Electric Fleet was moved into the building, and HET, Historic Electric Traction, became involved with its ongoing restoration and care. Along with this, the electrical supply was again augmented, again by myself, to permit enough power for restoration work to proceed. At this time, the compressor house building was still in use as the main substation and power supply operating off the Railcorp network. In 2002, a development proposal was forwarded for, for the Carriage Works precinct, which involved the conversion of the paint shop and parts of the Carriage Works site into a railway museum. The site would be made available to various railway heritage groups for restoration and operation of heritage rolling stock, including the already present electric fleet with HET. As a concession, most of the land adjoining Wilson Street would of course be sold off and developed into medium-rise residential housing of between six and eight storeys height, with part of the revenue going towards restoring the heritage buildings for ongoing museum use. The open spaces therein would become public spaces and be developed accordingly with some commercial zoning. However, the majority of railway functionality within the buildings, along with Traverse No. 1 and the Fan of Tracks, would remain. The New South Wales government of the time never really embraced this idea. While it was revenue neutral, it clearly wasn't going to deliver the cash windfall they were looking for. They wanted something bigger, much bigger. For the following five years, virtually nothing happened except that the responsibility for the ongoing tenure of the paint shop itself was transferred from Railcorp to HET, as Railcorp no longer wanted to pay the wages of the supervisor who had previously carried out this work when HET's volunteers could do it for free. 
The 2008 proposal, which is variously referred to in several of the 2022 technical documents, was a gross overdevelopment proposal which would see parts of the paint shop demolished and replaced with residential towers along with a series of towers spaced along the fan of tracks. It was clearly never going to gain the support of the New South Wales Heritage Council or even the local area council, let alone find a private investor willing to take the risk of developing into this potential. As a result, the site has remained untouched now until the present day, with the fabric of the paint shop building now in a fairly advanced state of decay. When it rains, it rains more now on the inside than it does on the outside. All of the gutters are rusted through and the stormwater systems are derelict. Parts of the shed and some of the pits routinely flood when it rains, despite having HET investing considerable time and resources cleaning drains and maintaining the site. The overly damp interior has required installation of weatherproof switchboards to the electrical system, the most recent having been fitted only last month. The fan of tracks has received some maintenance, but not much. Most of the area has been covered with road base, exacerbating flooding and drainage problems and preventing repairs to the track. The last rail movement there occurred in January 2021 when preserve set W3 was retrieved and replaced with double deck preserve set S56 on road zero. The fabric of the paint shop building is now in a fairly advanced state of decay. The irony of this fact is that, as a result, it has now become a highly sought after filming location, being one of the last post-industrial derelict sites left accessible in Sydney. The paint shop is routinely used for filming everything from features to television shows, the most recent being Channel 7's Beauty and the Geek, which screened on 25th of July. Revenue raised from these hirings goes towards HET's ongoing fight to maintain the building, at least to a standard which prevents further deterioration of both the building and the contents therein. They are relatively tiny four- and five-figure sums when compared with the ridiculous amount of money that's just been spent on this most recent proposal, which we will now take a look at in detail. Before we get on with the technical documents, let's start by taking a look at the key document tabled with this proposal, the Draft Paint Shop Sub-Precinct Design Guide. Where we find on page 36 under 4.24 views, we here find listed for the first objective of the proposal these words. A to preserve and enhance views that contribute to the heritage values of the paint shop sub-precinct and the broader Everly Railway workshops. Okay, so this is a primary objective of this so-called proposal that you've just heard there. Preserve and enhance views that contribute to the heritage values of the paint shop sub-precinct and the broader Everly Railway workshops. Just keep that in mind. Okay, now we'll turn to the Heritage Interpretation Strategy Document, Part 354, uh, authored by Curio Projects, and we'll start with page 45, where it says, The paint shop is of aesthetic significance, being one of the finest examples of industrial buildings at Everly and in Australia, known for its size, scale, industrial form and character. The preservation of the interior of this structure is one of the best in industrial complexes from the late 19th century in Australia. The paint shop is rare in New South Wales, especially associated with the Everly Railway workshops as a relatively intact workshop, which was a key element in the function of the ERW. The structure includes very early surviving heritage fabrics such as the original 1880s roller door mechanisms, hardwood timber, blocked floors, early water, gas, electrical and air lines, original cast iron windows and hardware. Let's just remember what we're talking about there with those air lines at that point. Okay, let's discuss it. Interpretation seems to be an important theme here. For many years now, I've come to watch young HET members visit the paint shop on work days for the first time. Indeed, one of the most recent workers was my own daughter, Kimberly, who was so impressed with the untouched beauty of the place that she even wrote a poem about it. She then commenced regular visits, getting her hands dirty, working on mechanical maintenance of the HET carriages in an environment which just didn't expose her to that history it took her back in time to relive it for real. HET even has among their membership a resident artist who attends the site just to create wonderful paintings. Dozens of HET's younger members are instantly drawn in by the mysterious sense of discovery about the paint shop. 
The fact that there is no interpretation whatsoever leads them to make their own interpretation and fuel the need to find out more and more. I don't believe a redeveloped paint shop with professionally interpreted heritage displays would have the same effect, or indeed any effect. What artist wants to spend all their time looking about how someone else interprets the world about them? What songwriter would do nothing other than listen to other people's songs? That's right, none of them. Today's young generations aren't interested in how everyone else interprets history. They want to explore it, discover it and find out for themselves. That's what every single new visitor does when they enter the paint shop and goes through HET's induction process, which in many ways isn't much more than a guided tour through a magnificent piece of as hidden Australia's history. Either unintentional or otherwise, the paint shop in its current ungentrified form has inspired dozens or possibly hundreds of people in Sydney's artistic and engineering communities recently to find out for themselves more about the building and its history. Any attempt to interpret that history of the building might suggest that the history of the records ended in 1988 when the former workshops closed and that the only history worth interpreting, at least in terms of the strategy document, only refers to activity which took place here before that time, mostly in the early part of the 20th century. To interpret a building's history in this way is to completely ignore the impact of the building has on people today. The strategy document will have us believe that nothing has happened here since 1988, and yet a hell of a lot has happened here since then. Some of the most interesting and inspiring stories about the paint shop and surrounding areas all took place well after 1988, and yet not a single one of them is mentioned in any of the technical documents which are supposedly going to be used to interpret the history of the paint shop. The idea that you can just interpret history and then use it like a rubber stamp to legitimise a development represents a gross misunderstanding of what heritage actually is and how humans interact with it. You just can't rip up the fan of tracks and then lay bits of them back down again later in a park so they look like they were always there because then everyone knows it's fake. The interpretation and meaning is lost. It's no longer awe-inspiring. It's not like wow, stuff actually happened here, the Royal Train actually ran over this track. It just becomes, oh, that's nice, they've put some tracks here, let's have some coffee. You can't just move the remains of a compressor from a, the compressor house and bolt it to the floor in a public foyer somewhere at the front of a technology park because the very meaning and reason for existence there is lost. Why did the building even need an air compressor? I mean, what is an air compressor? The only way people can interpret history is to become part of it. And the only real way that can work is if the paint shop somehow retains some activity designed around its original purpose, which of course is that of maintaining heritage railway rolling stock. On page 73 of the Curio report, the timeline of history completely omits all activity in the paint shop that has taken place since the closure of the railway workshops there in 1988, 35 years ago. The intervening time between then and now represents over a quarter of the building's total life since it was built. Entire generations have come and gone in that time frame. Page 143, well, that goes on to mention adaptive reuse of buildings and even mentions movable heritage, museum, exhibition spaces and walking tours. Yet the actual development proposal bows its hat to none of those things. Rather, it denigrates the paint shop building to nothing more than just another space where supposedly new high-tech businesses can rent a few dozen spare metres for God knows what, how much per month. Just outside, the latte set, along with their visitors, can find yet another coffee shop to sit around and talk with their colleagues about how nothing seems real anymore. They'll probably reminisce about the days when you could still trawl Sydney and find wondrous and really cool things in little-known, dusty and forgotten corners where people were inspired and magic happened. Hmm. Kind of describes those HET work days that we currently hold at the paint shop right now, doesn't it? Oh, and by the way, those ancient airlines that the above strategy document talks about? Well, guess what? HET just completed a project of reactivating and using these same airlines only this month. Now, that's what I call heritage interpretation. Okay, now let's move on to the non-Aboriginal heritage study document that's also been prepared by Curio Projects. At a whopping 319 pages, it's one of the longest reports in the list and probably cost well over a million dollars to produce. We don't have to wait long for the contrasting and contradictory statements to begin. Let's start on page 12, where we can read, The almost complete obstruction of the view of the CME building to the locomotive workshops by the new building envelope will have a major visual impact 
to the historical contents, context and significance and connectivity between the North and South Everly sites. Is this report supposed to be in favour of the development or against it? OK, let's go on to page 13. We'll see some more summary work. Some of the elements and associated works proposed by the master plan do present major impacts to the heritage values and significance of the paint shop sub-precinct. For example, the master plan will result in almost complete obstruction of the significant historical view from the Chief Mechanical Engineer's building south across the railway line to the locomotive workshops. This view was critical to the function and management of the overall ERW complex. We don't have to go any further than here to find that one of the most key reports tabled supposedly in favour of this project is in fact strongly opposed to it. The report goes on to list dozens of other reasons why it's a real bad idea to mess with the amenity and heritage status of the paint shop precinct. I can only assume that the powers that be that somehow paid for this either didn't bother to read it or perhaps they were incapable of reading it. One of Curio's most damning directives given in this document refers to the proposed overdevelopment plan for the paint shop. Ignoring the ridiculously ironic truth surrounding this name given to this proposed building, which is supposed to sit right on top of the paint shop and could truly be described as an overdevelopment in every respect, let's take a look at what Curio actually have to say about the idea. Okay. Curio understand that the need for interconnectedness between the paint shop and the rest of the development precinct and the new built form is part of the viability of the future of building use and availability to attract appropriate future tenants. However, from a heritage perspective, the solution currently proposed by the master plan to achieve this connectivity, i.e. the construction of an overdevelopment over and above the existing paint shop roof, would entail a substantial level of physical and visual intervention and impact on the state's significant building, such that the overdevelopment option would not be the preferable development solution for the site on purely heritage grounds. It's also important to acknowledge that the Heritage Council of New South Wales has also raised considerable concerns, feedback and general opposition to the paint shop overdevelopment element, as communicated in the HCNSW letter dated 12th of April 2022. Thus, from a heritage perspective, it would be preferential for the new built form of the overdevelopment to be removed from the above the paint shop, with equivalent floor space potentially relocated into new adjacent buildings, and other solutions to connectivity at ground plane level between the paint shop and new built form explored. OK, let's just consider what we've heard. The 2008 heritage study on the paint shop described the heritage significance of this building as exceptional. It's clear from the description above that any proposed alterations to the paint shop beyond mere restoration and repair can be seen as a retrograde step towards destroying this exceptional significance. It's easy from this to see that constructing 28-storey residential buildings just outside the entrance, well, that ain't going to cut it either. Whilst it may be appropriate to develop some of the land closer to Wilson Street, the land adjacent to and surrounding the paint shop itself should be seen as sacrosanct and not suitable for any development whatsoever, which may result in partially or even totally obscuring the view of the building from other areas, particularly the CME's building, Redfern Station itself, and also across the tracks from South Everly. But that's not all. Let's read a few more of these beaut quotes from the Curio Report, shall we? OK, page 222 has this gem. The locations, form, fabric, bulk and height of the new built form and the development should aim to be subservient to the extant heritage buildings within the paint shop sub-precinct, particularly the paint shop. Page 223 has this to say. The scale, bulk, height and location of new buildings should respect the scale, height, form and materiality of the primary heritage buildings on site, being the paint shop, to ensure that the key physical and visual attributes of the heritage items are respected and reinforced, not diminished by the new buildings. Hmm. Page 224. Any future works to the following heritage items within the paint shop sub-precinct should retain their dominant form, layout and significant fabric. Hmm. Page 226. Opportunities for future interpretation displays within the paint shop include wider New South Wales Rail Heritage Collection, not only those items that relate specifically to Everly. Wow! Do I smell a whiff of the original 2002 proposal rearing its head as an alternative here? <laughs> Let's read on. In page 243, it says this. 
The HCNSW letter clearly outlined strong concerns of the Heritage Council regarding the proposed paint shop overdevelopment element of the 2022 Master Plan. Specifically, the letter dated that the HCNSW view that the paint shop building is a great opportunity for a low-rise reuse, similar to that of the low-rise locomotive workshop in South Everly. Its sawtooth roof profile is particularly dramatic when seen against the clear sky and is a tangible reminder of this area's industrial past. This is an aspect of the building which, in our opinion, should not be compromised. Hmm. OK, page 256. Here we go again. Construction of the overdevelopment above the existing paint shop roof will entail substantial physical and visual interpretation, sorry, intervention into the fabric of the state significant building with an irreversible impact on the impactness and significance of that building. Therefore, from a heritage perspective, Curio's recommendation is that the overdevelopment option is not the preferable development solution. <laughs> Page 281, this is the killer too. Since the closure of the ERW in the late 1980s, Transport Heritage employees and volunteers have for years continued the practice of undertaking works to maintain and conserve heritage rolling stock, maintaining a continuity of practice of this nature within the paint shop, unbroken since 1888. The paint shop and the former suburban car workshops have also been used intermittently over the years as filming locations for the screen industry and is likely to have some significance to the local Darlington and Redford communities for this reason. Well, wow, eh? What a bunch of whoppers. <laughs> Curio, well, they appear to have been the only external consultants with enough dare and gall to punch huge holes in the government's own plan for Everly North and then have their own work published as part of that plan. Touché. OK, so this is where I think we'll wrap it up. It should be clear to all of you now that this most recent proposal for the paint shop area is nothing more than a mirage of lies and poorly researched concepts similar to the 2008 one. Their own contracted consultants don't even believe that the idea will work. North Everly and the paint shop needs help now. And this crazy idea isn't going to deliver the goods. It's clear that this is what's going to happen again. OK, I reckon the proposal will probably receive strong opposition from both local government, the New South Wales Heritage Council, as we've already seen, and likely the local community. As a result, the development application will not succeed and will most likely end up in the New South Wales Land and Environment Court. After millions of dollars in lawyers' fees, the LEC rules that will rule the development is way too big and recommend it reduce in size and floor space, with the paint shop overdevelopment gone and the residential towers significantly truncated in size and height. Meanwhile, another five years will drag past while the poor old paint shop continues to fall apart and HET's meagre resources and volunteers continue to valiantly step up the fight not to let the building die altogether. As a result of the Land and Environment Court ruling, private developers who probably signed onto the project early will then realise that the risk is too high for them and probably drop out. The project will become unviable with the new floor space limits. No developer will be found to replace them, so the project will fall again into development hell. Again, again and again. Most likely well after a change of the New South Wales government anyway. Uh, and then they'll just be rinse and repeat. Every time the New South Wales government comes up with another one of these grossly overcooked proposals, just like this one, another 10 years will creep by with nothing done. OK, so the only way North Everly is going to be developed and given to the public the way it should be is for the owner the New South Wales government, to get realistic about the value of the site with its heritage restrictions intact rather than seek to stretch or change these boundaries. A revisit of the 2002 proposal, well, that would well be recommended. Medium-rise development across the Wilson Street corridor with the remainder of the site remaining as is and restored to the condition where it can be used by the community for heritage and arts or a combination of both. The site is ideally located for the establishment of a true Sydney Railway Museum, an idea which should be given serious consideration. And I'll leave you with this. In the words of Sam Mullins, who's the Director and Chief Executive Officer of the London Transport Museum, after we visited here back in 2016, rail heritage in New South Wales is like a donut, and in the middle of the donut is Sydney. Let's change that. <laughs>